Hi, in this video, I want you to talk briefly about vector description of motion. This is figure 4.7 from the textbook, and I thought it gave a pretty good context for illustrating the usefulness of vectors as a way to describe motion. So let me start. Imagine that you have a particle moving along some path. And one way to describe the motion, which isn't really a description at all, is to have a video of the particle actually moving along the path. I guess um, <laughs> it's hard to put it in words or anything, but that's one way to capture what the particle is doing. Now, the difficulty with that is, once again, it's not a description. <laughs> Uh, you have to process that video somehow. You have to extract the information that relates to the motion in a format that's not a video. So it's in this context where you have seen coordinate axis before. And the coordinate axis is a really useful tool. It allows you to describe the x and y position of the particle, that would be uh, what you read off of the axis here, and what you read off of the axis here, get it as a function of time, and now you have a mathematical description of the motion of the particle. So at this point, the motivation for introducing vector is really this. With this coordinate description, there is a bit of an arbitrariness to how this description is done. Suppose that you don't put the origin where I put it, but you put it a little bit to the right and above where I put it. Or suppose that you put it a little bit to the left and below where I put it. Then you see how as you move the origin of your coordinate axis, your x and y component of the motion changes. And this is what I mean by arbitrariness, that the form of the function that you use to describe the motion depends on where you put the coordinate axis, the origin of the coordinate axis, and different people might choose different coordinate axis. And it's not necessarily an incurable problem. You've heard me or other people say um, just to be consistent in a problem. And that's one way to deal with it. But it lacks a sense of elegance. So let me give you the vector description. So in the vector description, you imagine an arrow pointing to the position of the particle. And by convention, this vector, arrow, originates from the origin. And as this particle moves, this position vector changes also to point to the new location of the particle. Now, if you're thinking, that doesn't sound any less arbitrary because these arrows still depend on where the origin is. It's coming from the origin. Well, that is correct. These two vectors, which is a function of the time, so far they are not illustrating coordinate axis independence. But watch what happens when I describe motion. That is, instead of describing just the positions, I look at the change in position. Using the head-to-tail method, this uh, delta r vector can be drawn from the r vector to the r vector after time delta t. And it's uh, this delta r vector that illustrates the coordinate axis independence. As we move the coordinate axis, if we move the coordinate axis, the vector r and the vector r at time t plus delta t are going to change by the same amount. 
So the constant amount that they change by cancels out. And this delta r, which goes from tip of one vector to the tip of the other vector, remains the same. So with this, let me describe how this simplifies our description of motion. All right, so I got rid of everything except for the particle trajectory itself and delta r. Oh, and uh, I don't have a reference for these coordinates anymore, so let me get rid of the coordinates. I think now we are ready to describe motion in a very simple way. So we are going to have some finite interval delta t in mind. This is so that the displacement vector delta r that we draw won't be a zero length vector. But the actual duration of time delta t, it can be a lot of different values. I guess uh, we say without loss of generality, we choose delta t to be some finite value. Then, as you imagine this particle moving, this is basically what you could do. You could look at, in time delta t, how far does it move? That's your delta r. In time, another time delta t, how far does it move? That's another delta r, delta r, delta r, and so on. You can do that for the entire trajectory. Uh, I won't draw it for the entire trajectory. Let me just draw it at a few points and use that to show how that to use to describe motion. Oh, and one more thing. I am going to draw delta r's, assuming that the speed remains constant. All right, so here's an example delta r at the beginning of the motion. In delta t, this is how far the particle would move. And here's another example of delta r towards the end of the motion. And even though I said this would be a constant speed motion, you can see visually that it's not a constant velocity motion. This is how. These delta r vectors, when you bring them together and compare them, then they are roughly equal in length. They are supposed to be. But you see that their directions are different. So during the motion of the particle, the direction of delta r changes which means the average velocity, v is equal to delta r over delta t, is changing. And this is a powerful graphical way to describe motion and possibly even intuitive once you develop the intuition for it. Uh, let me do one more example. Let me show constant velocity motion. So a constant velocity motion should look like this. A particle starts out at one end, and it's going to end at the other end. And if you just follow its trajectory, it draws a more or less straight line. Or if we are recording videos of the particle moving, then it looks like this. Starts here, moves at the constant speed, moving in a straight line from one end to the other. Yeah, I'm not really good at moving it at constant speed, but you get the idea. So let me draw this delta r, the displacement vector over this duration of time delta t at a few points along the trajectory. So here's one at the midpoint. And at the beginning, it's the same speed, so roughly the same length and towards the end. And this is how you can visually see that the velocity of the ball is constant as it moves across. The length of the arrow, the velocity vector, doesn't change. That's by design. And the direction of the velocity vector doesn't change. So this uh, usage of a vector as a coordinate independent way to describe a physical phenomena it's something that's more important at higher levels of physics. Um, in physics 4a, very often when we do have vector, we are going to define coordinate axis, and we are going to break down vectors into components. But I didn't want you to lose the side of the mathematical elegance of the vector for the way we use it at this beginning level. So until next time, bye.